Hello, everyone. We are back from a three-week trip in the States, sort of front-ending this episode to say that for the first 10 minutes, I had CeCe's microphone backward. And for the audio engineers, you know this. When that happens, I have to turn up the gain to get more signal, and it just created all kinds of problems. Midstream, I realized the microphone was set up backwards. And so about 10 or 12 minutes in, I flip it around. So my apologies for the rookie engineering mistake. That's my bad. It has to do with the fact that we unplugged everything before we left the, the studio. But anyway, we are back. We are happy to be back, and we are going to talk about the 1992 film Sister Act. So I hope you enjoy. Okay, we are back. We are back home. We're back we are home. Back on the podcast. We what did what have we been doing recently? Well, we went to California on vacation. We did. We just got back from vacation in California. We spent three weeks in California and it was great. Yeah. And we, you're from California. You're from San Francisco. Yes. So we went to see your family. Yeah, we I wanted to introduce you to my hometown mm -hmm. and show you around. Mm -hmm. And then at the same time, you wanted to see my family. You thought it was really important to see yeah, my was, family. Yeah, imperative. That... And then all of a sudden, your parents became kind of attached to it. And they came too. They came all the way from Busan mm -hmm. to come and spend three weeks in San Francisco and around the Bay Area and around the mountains and, and right. all of that. And we had this great reunion, or sorry, not a reunion, a union of the mm -hmm. two families, the Kims and the Bachos. Mm, yeah. And it was great. It was amazing. Except yeah. we both caught COVID. Yeah. Um, I caught it first, and then I gave it to everybody who um, we went to. Yeah. Like, we went on a trip with a couple of your friend, with three of your friends. Yes. I gave it to the entire little COVID pod mm -hmm. that we had set up. We had our little community of COVIDers, COVIDians. The really anxiety-inducing part of get, catching COVID while you're abroad is that Korea still insists on requiring PCR tests mm -hmm. to go back to Korea. And it doesn't matter if you're a Korean citizen. If you test positive, you can't go back to your own country, which yeah. I think is unconstitutional. It's it's yeah. ridiculous. And they, they still insist on this, even though yeah. Korea has one of the, the most cases, like the most... This is, yeah. this is the weird thing that blows my mind. Korea has more cases than the United States. Mm -hmm. So what are they afraid of bringing in from you know the what? outside? You know what I think it is? At this point, it really is just for show. Mm -hmm. And a lot of things in Asia are like this. And this, you know... Has, the appearances, yeah. Yeah, it's all about the appearances. It's because, you know, it was initially about the new variant. Mm -hmm. But the new variant has also has already spread yeah. like wildfire here. Like right. everybody had it mm -hmm. this past month. And so now they're doing this under the guise of, well, we want to figure out if there's a new, yet another new variant coming right. in from, which kind of makes sense, I guess. But then at the same time, it's just like, w until when is this going to, like, when is the end? Well, this is, this is my problem. I, mm -hmm. you can't have it both ways. Like when we were in San Francisco, the things that, that was shocking to me mm -hmm. Coming from Korea, where the service industry is fantastic in Korea, mm. and during COVID, everybody's wearing masks. All the food service people are wearing masks. We get to San Francisco, and we're in North Beach, which is great, mm. but all the food service people are unmasked. Yeah. And it's like, I can just almost imagine the spit just traveling to my right. face. Well, I, I want... Or traveling onto my food or into my coffee cup. I just couldn't believe it. So there's that aspect of it. Right. But then the other side of it is, no, this is a state of emergency mm -hmm. still. So all I ask for is consistency. Mm -hmm. One way is it, are we in a state of an emergency or is it done? And well, it seems it was, like we're not there yet. Yeah, but I think it's just a matter, it's a difference between like countries we haven't reached a right. consensus like in the u.s it's done now they've moved yeah. on to monkeypox it seems enough so that they will talk on my food and give me covid i understand i mean you know i mm -hmm. i wrote about this i read about mm -hmm. this i i understand you know for example agamben's concept of the mask is the defacing of the person mm -hmm. is the first one of the first mm -hmm. signs of you know rendering somebody politically unviable i so i understand that concept mm -hmm. When it comes to food service, it was just a shock to me okay. to go from South Korea to the United States and then for us to get COVID probably because of this. Yeah. 
And then to have to, you know, situate ourselves in the situation where going back to Korea now, Mm -hmm. we are threatened with not being able to come back home because of this. Don't we have a frigging World Health Organization or isn't there some kind of body? Well, they prove themselves to be entirely useless. Well, they're also corrupt and they... Yeah. Yeah. And they have special interests. But. Yeah. So this was this whole COVID nineteen thing was very illuminating for me, and I mm. think I've really, <laughs> on a personal level, I've really grown as a person <laughs> yeah. through this experience. And but it also made me really blasé towards a lot of things. Like I care less and less about so many things now. Like what? Well, the opinion of other people, um, and also people. You know, the way people behave doesn't surprise me anymore. Like, I am just not shocked at anything. Mm -hmm. The behavior of other people, the behavior of nations, Mm -hmm. of governments. Mm -hmm. I'm just, nothing really shocks me the way it used to. Mm -hmm. I'm more concerned about the environment. I'm more concerned about, like, things like trees burning down. Mm -hmm. Because I feel like things are just going to get collectively, like just gradually going to get worse Mm -hmm, until it mm -hmm. becomes unbearable. And I just want, I just want that to be prevented. I just want the unbearable to be prevented because things are getting worse. I just want things to suck less. I just want things to suck at a more gradual pace than Mm -hmm. it has been. Like it's been so accelerated. And yeah, we, we've kind go, of numbed ourselves yeah, to I'm, I'm to really numb. Yeah. I've let go of so many things. So when when I see food workers not wearing masks, I don't have an opinion. I think it was it. just a, it was a yeah. culture shock to me, and yeah. and then to contrast that with Korea, yes. it, it was anyway. Um, we that aside, we yes. sort of concentrated on the negative, mm-hmm. but um, that didn't that didn't really impede too much of our trip. We had a really good trip, and we ate a, a lot of trip. food. Yeah, we ate a lot of meat. Mm -hmm. I had so much meat and I don't like to eat a lot of meat. I'm not vegetarian, but I don't like to eat a lot Mm -hmm. of meat. And and it's just impossible because, you know, a salad costs 20 bucks. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Might as well just eat. And and the food and the meat food is so enticing. We could have had one of those $16 smoothies. (sighs) I never had a smoothie because that's just a waste of (laughs) food budget. The super smoothie that I saw in the Mission District. Yeah. (laughs) No, but we... um, yeah, we had a lot of good food. We went to the mountains. We went hiking. I got you hiking, and you actually enjoyed it. I mean, I, I wouldn't say I enjoyed it. Yeah, per you did. Se. I'm I'm choosing to believe that I you tolerated it. it. No, you had a good time. You did enjoy it. You wanted to keep going. Okay, it was some of the most beautiful landscape I've ever seen in yeah, my life. It's nice. um, we it's went the to Sierras. Yeah, it was beautiful. Lake. It was surreal. Yeah. yeah. It was an amazing. It was a beautiful, like a gorgeous. We lake. both had COVID. Yeah. <laughs> but we were hiking. Yeah. <laughs> In the in high altitude in the well, Sierra. the first hike that I went on, I the had day before. full COVID. Like, oh it was yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I fully had COVID, and I said to you like I feel sick, but then you were like, "You're fine. You just have heat heat exhaustion." I thought you had heat exhaustion. But then I shouldn't have gone on the hike. Then well, if I had we didn't know. Exhaustion. We didn't know. But um, I went on like a full hike, and then I gave everyone COVID. But yeah, there was a lot of um, there was a lot of hiking. And a lot of walking around the city. We went to a lot of places in San Francisco. We went to all the neighborhoods in San yes. Francisco. And I must say, as somebody who had never really experienced San Francisco before, I went. I been You'd there been when there. I was like six years old. Yep. I was like five or something, and mm-hmm. then I never went back there, so I didn't remember it. But I just felt really good there. Mm-hmm. The, it was, you know, just something in the air. Is the weather, you mm-hmm. know, it was, a little, it was very chilly, but I felt really comfortable. And I will say this to a lot of people if they ask me, I have never felt so comfortable being Asian outside of Asia. San Francisco is great for that. Yeah. And I was like, this is amazing. It's it's very diverse mm-hmm. in so many ways. Mm-hmm. The little neighborhoods and little pockets. <clears throat> and yeah. everyone's so chill. Mm-hmm. Nobody is like it, I didn't. Fi- I didn't feel like this anxiety toward mm-hmm. that you know that I feel in New York. New mm-hmm. York has is very status anxious. Yeah, and San Francisco just doesn't have that. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm sure there are highly achieving people in San Francisco. I mean, you know, we mm-hmm. hear about all these like people who are brilliant. Oh and, yeah, you know these tech geniuses. There's a lot of money there, but mm-hmm. you don't really feel like that's. A prerequisite to be in the city, to live in the city. No, like, that's the is, thing about the city is you can yeah. be whoever you want to be. Yeah, you can be whoever you want to be. There's like such a variety of how to be. Like, Yeah, you said that you could probably 
go there as an old lady and and be crazy there and be crazy. Yeah, it would be a great place to be a crazy old Asian lady. Yeah, and I can I I think that's your future actually. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I could just blend in, yeah, and just sort of like chill, mm -hmm. like yeah, and and I don't, and I felt like I, I felt so free to be. I kept saying this, and you didn't really understand, but I was like, I no, I did be, understand you. No, I kept saying this phrase where I was like, I can be ugly in peace here. Oh, I don't, remember and that. I don't think you really understand what mm. I'm saying. But what I'm saying, what I'm trying to say is that I just felt so free. Like I, I didn't wear any makeup the whole time. Like it mm -hmm. was just like I was in my ugly hiking shoes the, in the entire time. And that's just the kind of vibe it is. Like nobody's trying to be anything. Like nobody's trying to project yeah. an image right. like everywhere else in the world mm -hmm. that I've been. Everybody, everywhere else I feel like is trying to project an image. It's a city originally, I was trying to tell you th mm -hmm. this at one point, but it's a city of freaks. That's that's the mm. history of it. That's the history of San Francisco. Mm. And, and it, I wonder and why. It, and it lingers. Well, mm. it's, you know, it was it was a strange amalgamation of people, you know, coming together, mm -hmm. um, and then you know in the fifties, you know, the the whole beat poetry thing mm -hmm. really started emerging. And um, I mean, if you if you really look into it, the weather was a big part of it. You know, the the mild weather and the clear blue sky and, and the landscape there, and it's mm -hmm. really just a good location. But then. I think at one point I told you there's like, we went on kind of a hike. I think it was Buena Vista Park or mm -hmm. something like that. And I was telling you that the, that the, the fauna, mm -hmm. or sorry, the flora mm -hmm. and the people mm -hmm. are kind of similar. You've got these strange kind of, you know, whether it's manzanita or these other kind of uh, shrubs that are kind of growing in weird patterns. Yeah. And I think the people are like that. <laughs> yeah. Like they're just strange. They're, they, 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 they think like shrubs. Mm -hmm. I can't really explain it, but it, it's just kind of everything's freaky. Everything's a little weird. Mm -hmm. Everything's a certain color. Mm -hmm. There's there's smells, you know, there's eucalyptus everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, it smells weird. And it just kind of, it's just a freaky city. And it's always been that way. And there's sort of a strange kind of resonance between the people who live there and the environment itself, I think. That makes sense. So yeah, we, um, yeah, we spent a lot of time in San Francisco. We saw a lot of different neighborhoods, mm -hmm. including... Yes. Noe Valley, mm -hmm. which is one neighborhood in San Francisco. You were actually on the edge of it twice. When we went to okay. Mitchell's Ice Cream, Oh, okay. that's the edge of oh. Noe Valley. And then one of the other edges is kind of just um, south of Dolores Park. So we Got went it. to Dolores Park. Okay. So that's the Noe Valley area. Got and it. it's this kind of upper middle class mm -hmm. area with restaurants and mm -hmm. dogs and mm -hmm. all of that. And this is the setting of the film we saw today, yes. which is called <laughs> Sister Act. Sister Act, and we chose this film at the last minute because mm -hmm. we were trying to find uh, a movie that was about music, but also about San Francisco. Yeah, and this set is in San Francisco. Set in San Francisco, yeah. and this is the one that came up. Mm -hmm. I had never seen the movie before. Mm -hmm. You had seen it before. I had seen it before. I really liked the second movie, mm -hmm. which we didn't see. Right. Yet. We haven't seen yet. I don't know if we're, you know, you want to do oh, that. We might see it. You know, again, this is a movie from 1992. It's directed by someone I'd never heard of named Emil Ardolino, Ardolino, an mm, Italian okay. name. And I just read that he died of AIDS the, the year after that. Oh. He also made a movie called Dirty Dancing. Oh, uh, The Dirty yeah. Dancing? Okay. Like Patrick Swayze? And... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. So is he a San Francisco native? Um, I don't know. That's a good question. Hmm. Not that everybody who died from AIDS is from San Francisco. Oh, I didn't even think of I that. Did, I thought you I meant thought in terms of the setting. Like, yeah, the, in terms of the setting. Yeah. Born in... Oh, no, he was born in New York. Okay. And grew up doing Broadway stuff. He did a lot of theater type um, mm, got it. productions okay. and movies. Yeah. So oh, that's this not, was very theatrical. It was very theatrical. Yeah, yeah. Um, but around 1992, I think I've, we've discussed this before, but mm -hmm. around that time, I, I wanted no part of movies like this mm -hmm. because it was just, you know, I was a serious 23-year-old, you know, dude. Uh -huh. So I, I didn't watch movies like this. This is also the Whoopi period where mm -hmm. I think it's post-Ghost. Definitely. Yeah. And I had had enough of Whoopi by then. <laughs> I think she's great. I thought yeah. she was fantastic in the movie The Player. Um, which I loved, but there was so much whoopee going on yeah. during this period of time. Mm -hmm. I just had enough. Okay. Well, I was nine, so I watched this and I loved it. 
<laughs> Were you nine when you watched yeah, it? Yeah, I was nine when oh I watched God. it. Oh my God. So that makes sense. I didn't, I, th- I thought it was going to be kind of a, you know, there's this weird thing with comedies in like the early 90s. Mm-hmm. They're just so dated. Yeah, I thought it was like a Gary Marshall movie when I first saw this. Like a, I was like, yeah, what's his name? Um, Frank Marshall? Is it Gary, Gary Marshall? Marshall? Is it Gary yeah, Marshall? Yeah, yeah. Pretty Woman, the one who did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Kind of did- yeah, these kind. It's these kind of. You know, and I'm thinking of like, uh, uh, um, Desperately okay. Seeking Susan and movies like that this. Was where the just, 80s, babe. That but was, that was late 80s. No, I think that was 89. That was not the late 80s. No, I, no, that was mid 80s. Okay, well, it's got yeah. that same kind of feel though. Yeah. So maybe mid 80s to early 90s. There's, mm-hmm. you know, like kind of bad editing. Yeah, it was like a joke movie. Yeah, and the the first maybe 20 minutes was really poorly done i thought yeah. as far as movies go yeah. like you know they're intercutting between her approaching mm-hmm. the office where harvey Keitel mm-hmm. kills the guy this mm-hmm. is the beginning of the movie mm-hmm. and they keep cut intercutting back and forth back and forth back and forth that whole dw griffith technique of simultaneous mm-hmm. action but they do it like freaking five times it's like okay we get it yeah. she's going to walk in on the mm-hmm. murder in mm-hmm. progress but they had to do it like five mm-hmm. times so it was really I thought badly edited, but then once she got to the the church, mm-hmm. the convent. the convent, the movie changed and it got much better. Yeah, because music was involved. Because music was involved. Yeah. And then we got to see Whoopi lead the chorus, the choir, sorry. <clears throat> I must admit that I forgot there were a lot of Whoopi movies, but mm-hmm. when I saw her in this one again, because it's been a while since she's been in a movie... I realized how good she was. The comedic timing. Well, the first, the opening number when they're singing in Reno. Mm -hmm. So the plot of the movie is she's a singer in Reno. She's got these two backup singers and they're doing lame ass Mm. shows in Reno. Mm. And I couldn't help thinking of my friend Michelle who (laughs) lives in Vegas and she does show. I mean, she does really good shows and she's a great Mm -hmm. singer. But I wonder if she's ever had gigs like this is what mm-hmm. I was wondering because the you know, there's slot machines and there's like two di- two old dudes, you know mostly old watching people. them. Yeah. But her her comedic moves, her physical mm-hmm. comedy was very subtle during that. It was great. And it was great. Yeah. And we kept laughing. Like yeah. we laughed a lot watching yeah, yeah. this movie. It was great. She was great. Yeah, she was really good. And she is, I think, a really a really good actor. Again, I had gotten sick of her by this point and I didn't see the movie, but I thought I she was great. I can understand that too. I can understand you being sick of her because mm-hmm. she was in a lot of movies like it started yeah. around like it was after color purple yeah all of a sudden it oh was she was like the big every thing year yeah there was a Whoopi goldberg movie mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. um but i liked all of them at the time yeah she started out as a comedian did she yeah and she has bay area connections she has san francisco connections so it's not mm-hmm. surprising maybe i wonder if maybe it's set in san francisco because of her i'm not sure perhaps she was great there's so harvey Keitel is you know playing totally to type he's mm-hmm. the uh, mob boss mm-hmm. who's her lover mm-hmm. um and she catches him killing somebody and then she has to hide in this convent mm-hmm. there's maggie smith as professor mcgonnell <laughs> <laughs> as the the mother um what, what is, what is it she's the she's the head nun yeah yeah. Is it called Mother Supreme? Mother Superior? I don't Superior. know. Superior. I don't know. Or is that a is that a song? I don't know. Mother Superior. Yeah, I, I'm very confused now. I I could have sworn I saw Mother Supreme or Mother Superior or something. Mm, okay. But anyway, she's the head nun. Yeah, I'm not well versed in um, me neither. None You're of the it. one who's Catholic. <laughs> yeah, I am Catholic, but um, I don't know much about nuns. And Radio Rahim mm-hmm. is in this movie, mm-hmm. which was great because mm-hmm. I think. I, I may have seen him in other movies, but I just, you know, of course he's famous for being, mm-hmm. and I'm mentioning his character because I can't think of the actor's name, but he was the, in Spike Lee's Do the Right Thing, you mm-hmm. know, the love, hate, the guy with the boombox. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And he was, I thought, really good as the um, yeah. police detective. So, um, yeah, I thought it I thought it was really good. Um, and then, I mean, it's kind of a, it's kind of a typical movie. It's, mm-hmm. it's, a, it's, a, it's a very cookie cutter screenplay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, because you've got the setup, you've got the she's got to move, you know, and then go mm-hmm. to this place and hide out, and you know that the two streams of action are going to intersect, mm-hmm. you know, at the end, and mm-hmm. of course they do, and that she's going to go on a transformational kind of character arc, which she does, mm-hmm. and you know, you've got in one sense the antagonist is Harvey Keitel's character, but in another sense it's Maggie Smith, so it's sort of this, you know. Whoopi Goldberg is this, you know, kind of flashy lounge singer, mm-hmm. black woman. And I think that should be mentioned because I thought that Maggie Smith's reaction to her was, 
I don't want to say racist, but it's like, oh, there's this black woman invading yeah, my convent. It yeah, was a little it bit. It was very much so, though. Like, yeah. I didn't know it was if it was um, intentional. It, it dates it a little bit, I think. It totally dates it. And there was this idea, well, she was the only black woman there. Yeah, which and, was odd, I thought. Yeah, but then I also felt like, was that intentional because she brought in... So what happens she is that she... brought soul to the convent. Yeah, so they they had a horrible choir mm. who only did like profi- like the traditional hymns mm-hmm. that Catholics do. I don't know. Like, mm-hmm. And she brings in a bit of gospel yeah. into the church. And that's what brings like a whole new congregation. Like the whole... The church is like revived. Yeah. And so there's a revival aspect mm. to this story where she brings in this like gospel, like this Baptist culture... Yeah. This black um, church kind of thing mm-hmm. into this Catholic, this very white traditional mm-hmm. Catholic church, which doesn't happen. Like I, my understanding is that Catholic churches don't do that kind of thing because they're not like out to evangelize. The no, same I mean when I grew up, the, the Catholic church that I went to when I was a kid mm-hmm. was in Berkeley, and you have to imagine oh, okay. Berkeley in the 1970s. They we, they had a full band. Mm-hmm. I mean, it was all, actually, I can't remember if it was all white people, but um, like 16 guitar players. It was a full, it was like maybe, you know, three guitar players, a flute player, you know, a percussion player, a bass okay. player yeah, yeah. in this gorgeous Berkeley church. Um, oh, cool. And I think that's one of the things that got me into music was they would sing the hymns, they would perform mm-hmm. the hymns. Mm-hmm. But I think that's very unusual. It's I Berkeley. See. Yeah. So it's a Berkeley Catholic church. So. So I did experience some of that, but you're right that mm-hmm. this would be very unusual for a Catholic mm-hmm. choir. Mm-hmm. And yeah, so she brings soul to mm-hmm. these white women, mm-hmm. and and it's it's great. It, I liked how she. There's a moment when she takes over the choir, mm-hmm. and the stuffy old lady mm-hmm. kind of takes a back seat, mm-hmm. and she's like, "Okay, let's try to make a chord." This was cool to me. She says, oh, yeah. "Okay, the bass. Who are the bass? Who are the?" tenors and who are the sopranos Mm -hmm. so the bass are going to sing the d the sopranos are going to sing the a and then i forget the third note but they're going to f sharp f sharp Mm -hmm. okay so they're going to make a chord Mm -hmm. and she makes them make the chord and it's this great eye-opening moment for Mm -hmm. all of these singers Mm -hmm. like all of a sudden and it's a it's you know they 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 don't skimp on the scene (laughs) i mean they let Mm -hmm. this play out yeah and i thought it was interesting all of a sudden the next time they sing they're magnificent Mm -hmm. (laughs) which is just Obviously accelerating the, mm. the pace of the film, but no, I thought that was great. And of course, the controversy comes in, mm. What kind of what I was getting at earlier is Maggie Smith becomes, in a way, the antagonist, but more kind of like a, it's, it's, it's the tradition of the Catholic Church against mm-hmm. this kind of new um, spirited woman who comes in mm-hmm. and all of a sudden enlivens the community. Mm-hmm. So not just the church, but people start hearing this music from outside and, you know, like, and then you get a lot of color coming into the mm-hmm. church mm-hmm. and you get these people off the street to, who are enjoying this music and, and Maggie Smith is having a hard time with this adjustment because she's a traditionalist. Yeah. And she also thinks that the city has become unsafe. Right. That's another yeah. thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's interesting to me. I mean, we picked this for San Francisco. It's in no. It's take. Pl- it takes place in Noe Valley. But when you, if you know San Francisco, you you look mm-hmm. at where the setting and it looks like frigging Sixteenth and Mission. Mm-hmm. You know it, or the Tenderloin. It doesn't mm-hmm. look like Noe Valley at all. Mm-hmm. So I was looking on Wikipedia and they did they did that intentionally, but we didn't really see much of San Francisco. But yeah, so it's this kind of. Um, clash of tradition and kind of a new way of doing things. And I thought that aspect was really fascinating. Mm-hmm. So there's this whole idea of, I guess, I think I think of it as a pro-religion movie, actually. For sure. Because music is, I think, I'm not even religious, but I, when I was watching it, I re- was reminded that this is the primary purpose of music. Like this was, exactly. You know, yeah. Exactly, and that goes back to ancient times. Yeah, and that is what brings people mm-hmm. to God. Music is a vehicle to God. It you is, know? yeah. And that is basically what music is. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's the purpose of music. I think it's it's a very and it's a very spiritual. It's a universal, spiritual, very human experience to sing, and to hear this music and to feel music, and this cheesy little movie captured that quite well in in, i thought a kind of profound way Mm -hmm. yeah yeah yeah, i think so too and that was what i think made this movie a hit i think it's just so universal 
And you can't help but, you know, you don't have to be Catholic to really appreciate the sincerity of the nuns and, like, how cute they are, you know, Mm -hmm. and how devoted. Like, there's nothing, like, you can't not smile at something like that. Mm -hmm. Like, it's, you know, devotion and generosity, Mm -hmm. helping the community. And, Mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's so cute, right? And it's just so wholesome. Right. And then this woman who kind of... You know, it's implied that she's a little bit vulgar and she's a, you know, Reno, she's a lounge singer. Mm -hmm. Like she's a. Yeah. So Maggie Smith is in on Mm -hmm. the fact that she has to hide out there. None of the other nuns. She's on a witness protection program, right? And none of the other nuns are in on this. And Maggie Smith introduces her as a nun who's from a very progressive church in Reno. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) And um, the nuns are just dying to go out there and meet people and interact with the community. Yeah. And um, that's what this will be Goldberg character brings mm-hmm. to this church. And it kind of like livens up everybody. Yeah. There, there's kind of these two areas of mm-hmm. um, emergence, I guess. Mm-hmm. I don't know another way to put it, but yeah, you're right. So connecting with the community, whereas before they were separate, there's also in the nuns a sense of wanting to individually express themselves. Mm-hmm. And the reason why I found this so interesting is that that idea of individual expression Mm -hmm. can rub against the idea of faith in god you know Mm -hmm. because you're 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 coming up against these ideas of of ambition desire i see yeah you know music is dangerous Mm -hmm. kind of you know abandoning yourself to to that which is you know can get you off of the path of your devotion to the mm-hmm. Almighty, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, so that was that was also playing out as well. Like the the girl who sang some of the lead, you know, this little tiny girl who apparently you said didn't sing her own parts. She didn't. Yeah, so and I find it very. I, I, I'm really weird about this. I, mm-hmm. I I'm very I'm very insistent on like looking up who did the mm-hmm. dubbing. Mm-hmm. Who did the singing? Do you remember who the name of the person was? Andrea Roberts or something. something Andrea, like that, yeah. yeah, something. Um, she was apparently a Broadway singer, and uh, the actress did not do her own vocals. No. Okay, yeah. And and when she did her solo, I got chills. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I f- felt like Whoopi Goldberg did some stellar singing in this movie. So she like, did her own singing. In yeah. The, yeah. It was yeah, great. she sounded great. She sounded great. It's really mm-hmm. hard to do, you know, to sing like that. She yeah. had like this really clear... A lot of actors sing like this when they're very good at singing. Mm. Great enunciation, minimal vibrato. And just cutting, like, just very, very like precise. Like cutting tone. Yeah, like yeah. a precise tone. Mm-hmm. That's very hard to do. Mm-hmm. And she is that kind of singer. She's very natural, like, yeah. very good singer. It, great performance by Whoopi Goldberg, I felt like. Yeah, and I thought the choreography, it's interesting that this director, mm-hmm. you know, again, did did a lot of Broadway stuff and also did films with um, with a lot of song and dance. Um, the, Dirty dancing. Well, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but there's a lot. I'm looking at like his his um, film uh, credits. There's a lot of like... What else is there? Well, a bunch of things I've never... A bunch of things I've never heard of, but like um, Three Men and a Little Lady, The Nutcracker, mm. He Makes Me Feel Like Dancing. I've never heard of any of I've these movies. I've never heard of any of them. But it looks like a lot of sort of... Um, yeah, mu- musical type. I feel like stuff. Three Men and a Little Lady was part of that series of movies with like three men and a baby, and then three oh men. Yeah? yeah, okay. Yeah. I think they were from the eighties. Oh, you're right. Yeah, yeah. okay. Mm-hmm. And it was starring um, Steve who? Gutenberg, Tom Selleck, and Ted. Tom Danson. Selleck, yeah. Ted Danson mm-hmm. used to date Whoopi Goldberg. I, yeah, I knew that actually. Yeah, yeah, and there's a joke, but I'm not going to repeat it. Yeah, don't repeat it. Yeah, I, I already feel the wrongness of the yeah, joke. It's, it's I haven't wrong. even heard it's it. It's a Ted Danson but joke, but it's like about dating Whoopi. Yes, yeah, so I I feel how wrong it is because it's like probably an '80s fucking joke. Yeah, exactly. And yeah, <laughs> what would what, what we might call today an old man joke? Yes, exactly. Yeah. I don't. I don't need to hear it. <laughs> no, but. Another thing, another theme that I noticed about um, this movie is a, something that's discussed now more than, you know, before. Like, I think, like, in the 90s, we just took it for granted and everybody just, like, accepted it. But apparently there's this magical black woman trope. I was thinking present. about the yeah. uh, Manic Pixie Dream Girl in a different way. No. No, but... No, no but... <laughs> No, it's it's a similar kind of thing though. I, I the manic pixie dream girl is the one who saves the problem for the man. Yeah. This one, she's a magical person, mm-hmm. a magical black woman. Yeah. 
who saves these people. Right. That's yeah. all I meant. Okay. I, I feel like that's a bit of a reach, but... I mean, like, I, okay. I, I know. I do feel like that's a, because the man is a very important component of the Manic Pixie Dream Girl mm-hmm. because it's the Manic Trip Pixie Dream Girl is problematic because she is a tool for the man's journey. Mm-hmm. Right. And True. I feel like there's no man in this story. And, mm-hmm. and that kind of takes away from it. it can't I'm not be. saying they're equivalent. Yeah, I know, I know, I know. But like, I'm saying that someone comes along and is used as a kind of a, a savior for other people. Mm-hmm. Okay. And in this case, it's it's not a, a woman. It's like a magical black woman. Yeah. So I, apparently it's literally called the magical black woman trope. Mm-hmm. And this has been explored in, in, a, in a, you know, and, and the negative um, sort of ways that this, you know, could manifest in society and mm. how like, you know, in our psyche, we expect black women to do all this like free emotional work mm-hmm. <laughs> for, mm-hmm. you know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so, and this kind of exists in our subconscious mm-hmm. because of movies like right. this. <laughs> well, it's mm-hmm. now we've got a different version of this mm-hmm. with, um, you know, kind of some of the, I guess, virtue kind of ethics going on. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just a different manifestation of the way white people see people of color. Yeah. This is the ni- 92 version of that. Yeah. And, and it's it- still going. Well, there's also the magical black man. I'm thinking of, uh, mm-hmm. is it the Green Mile? Is that what the movie's called? Well, like actually, Stephen the King? trope is called Magical Negro or something. Oh, the Magical yeah, Negro. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. And if you start looking for this trope in movies, it's everywhere. Okay. So we've got, I just looked up, the Magical Negro is a supporting stock character who comes to the aid of white protagonists in a mm-hmm. film, in basically American film. So I guess uh, this Magical is Negro a- characters who often possess special insight or, mm-hmm. me- or mystical powers have long been a tradition in American fiction. So there's... Okay, so the term was popularized by Spike Lee. Mm, okay. um, so The Green Mile, the one I just mentioned. <laughs> mm-hmm. The Legend of Badger Vance, or yes. ba- Badger, ba- Bagger Vance. Mm-hmm. Um, and then... Oh yeah, so it's a modern day version of the Sambo, or the Noble Savage. Mm. So yeah, interesting. So she wouldn't be... It, it's a different take on that. Obviously I she's guess, the star. yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah. Yeah, so I wonder how that this movie is seen. Well, it still is. It's today. an interesting it's mm-hmm. an interesting point of discussion is just the idea of how I think white America sees black people, mm-hmm. um, which is often this kind of yeah, I guess a, a magical sense or an mm-hmm. exalted yeah, sense yeah. or somehow um you know, like almost primordially pure or something like that, you mm-hmm. know, a pure mm-hmm. sense of whereas the white person has gone mm-hmm off the rails or something like that. I don't know. It's I, I, don't, I, I'm, I don't know anything about this. I'm just talking off the top of my head. Mm-hmm. But you do see it prominent in film, and you also see it prominent in, you know, the way white people appropriate people mm-hmm. of color into mm-hmm. their kind of moral projections yeah. to the public. Mm-hmm. So it's interesting. So I would imagine that that is part of the popularity of this film. Yeah, I would imagine that too, especially yeah. in 1992. Especially in 1992, because this is the way in which it was. <laughs> That's when Clinton got elected. Yeah, it was like. I think the version of this now is like casting, like like Bridgerton. Is that what it is? Mm-hmm. Like you know, like casting people of color for no reason whatsoever, except to satisfy a sense of guilt. Well, <laughs> I, don't I don't know. I liked the diversity in Bridgerton. I never a lot. saw it. So I, I shouldn't really talk yeah. about it, but I do see it. I watched the yeah. TV show Frankenstein and there's mm-hmm. a, there's a, there's a black character there. And mm-hmm. the, I guess the thing that I have a, a strange time with is when it's anachronistic, when it's mm-hmm. out of its time, right, right. it seems like it deserves some kind of explanation. Yeah. And so I, I, I otherwise see that it's point. just planting a okay. minority in, yeah. in a, in a situation. I, I see that point, but I also see the logic in casting these actors in these roles because these stories are going to be told anyway. There's like a massive demand for these stories, mm-hmm, right? Mm-hmm. And a way to incorporate what Hollywood looks like now mm-hmm. is to just cast these roles in, you know, without explanation because you can't explain that every time. And I'm getting used to it. To be honest, like I was it was weird at first and then a year later, a year after a year of seeing this, mm-hmm. I've gotten so used to it that like when I see the Netflix adaptation of Persuasion and I see black and Asian people in it, I don't really think anything anymore. And I think that like it's okay because 
it's not going to be an accurate portrayal. Like, you know, if you... Yeah. You're not going to cast actual descendants of Vikings to play Vikings. You know, like... Okay. Well, two points that I would make. One, it depends on if you're doing a fantasy film Mm -hmm. or if you're doing a realistic film. Yeah. Like, if you're doing pure fantasy, like a musical is a pure fantasy, right? I don't know what Bridgerton is, Mm -hmm. but if it's a fantasy... Then I can I can see it. I think it's a fantasy. Okay. I mean, it's a historical. It's Regency. It's a Regency novel. Yeah. You know, which is practically fantasy to me. Right. Um, so there's that aspect. My mm-hmm. my bigger point though is I think that what's happening, mm-hmm. and this is a problem, mm-hmm. is that Hollywood mm-hmm. is continu and Netflix is continuing to tell white stories. Yeah, that's true. And just yeah, yeah. replacing. Yeah. Yeah white right. people with black actors and yeah. i wish we would get black stories for yeah. example yeah you're totally right yeah so this is my this is my problem with yeah. it but yeah, um you're totally right but i think this I, I you know like it it's a weird 1992 version of it in this movie mm-hmm. but she's such a she's such a commanding presence mm-hmm. and that it it doesn't feel forced to me it's true it just felt like this is the situation that happened yeah yeah totally yeah movies about music So you had mentioned that you'd seen the second movie, and you mentioned yeah. that uh, Lauren Hill was in it. Yeah, Baby Lauren Hill. But what like do you mean, pre- Baby Lauren Hill? Fuji's pre Lauren ah, Hill. Okay. Like pre singing rapping career, Lauren Hill. This mm-hmm. was her first gig. Okay. What Sister did she Act play? Two. So so what's the deal with Sister Act Two? So the nuns start teaching at this Catholic school, right? Or I don't know if they had been teaching there <clears throat> the same the nuns? whole time. Yeah, the same nuns. But now they're they're teaching a, at a Catholic school. They're running a Catholic school, and there's this one class, the music class. It's like out of control, and a lot of the degenerates in this class, the in the school, are enrolled in this class because it's like a really easy course to just pass, mm-hmm, apparently. Mm-hmm. And so they recruit Dolores to sort of like work her magic again. <laughs> sounds like yeah. Sounds like School of Rock. Yeah, it totally is. Yeah. <laughs> So she made a career out of this incident, right? Yes. Yeah. And so her career kind of blew up and she's headlining in Las Vegas. Okay. Now. So we see the magazine, yeah. the Rolling yeah. Stone covers yeah. and the Time Magazine covers yeah. at the end of the credits, the yes. rolling credits at the end of this movie. Yeah. And so she has a way, her career is like, has totally taken off. And the nuns come back. And because she feels so indebted towards the nuns and, you know, she loves them, you know, you could tell like by the end of this, this movie, she had totally like, yeah, and that was a nice arc of the It film. was really nice, yeah. And you could tell how that happened, right? Like mm-hmm. she really, Yeah, it was very yeah, real. The friendship was very real. And so when they come to Vegas to get her, she's like, okay, fine, you know. And then she goes, and then she puts on the nun out- now outfit again, and then she starts teaching there. Mm-hmm. And until that point, I was like, oh, it's a sequel, whatever. And then fucking Lauren Hill is, you see her in in the classroom. And she's like this brat, you know, who's like reluctant. I can imagine to, it, yeah, yeah. actually. I had never seen, she was like the prettiest girl I had ever seen. Like, mm-hmm. I was like, at that point, like 10. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I was like, who is this, like, creature? And then it turns out that she can sing, right? Mm-hmm. And she can rap and she can sing because she's Lauren Hill. <laughs> but yeah. we didn't know that at the time. And she opens her mouth and she out comes the most gorgeous singing I had mm. ever heard in my life. I really like Lauren Hill when she sings. Yeah. And it was crazy. Mm-hmm. I and, and the chills that I had when she opened up that that first moment and I still remember the song. It was like His Eyes on the Sparrow and it's a gospel song and she's on the piano and she's doing a duet with her friend, right? And they're just like having a conversation about like, you know, life cuz they're in high school and they're mm-hmm, just like, mm-hmm. yeah, whatever. And um the classroom is also like mostly minority like they're mostly black Mm -hmm. and that was that did not really happen in the 90s like Mm -hmm. you didn't really see a lot of mainstream movies like that Mm -hmm. and you know it was just like very new jack swing like 90s like you know the fashion and everything like you know Mm -hmm. it was so cool Mm -hmm. and i was like this is the coolest person i I just could not get lauren hill out of my my mind Mm -hmm. like Mm -hmm. i just wanted to be her Mm -hmm. like and that changed my life like that the her presence in this movie Oh my God, could she sing? That's so great. Yeah. Like some sometimes, you know, in your life, you come across these yeah. movies and these scenes that just kind of 
alter you. Yeah, and it just really, really changed my life. Like I was just like I started going to church, not because of this movie, but oh, like yeah? I did end up going to church hmm. and singing at a church, mm-hmm. you know, and that really, you know, helped me develop my my singing. Yeah, yeah. That was the very first, you know, oh, great. My very first stages, like the very first time that I performed was like at church, you know. Oh wow, I didn't know this. Yeah, I mean, I don't talk about it, I guess, because I don't go to church anymore. <laughs> yeah. But, but I it's, was, it's, it's a great story. I mean, and it's yeah, kind of, music, I didn't know that this scene with Lauren Hill kind yeah. of inspired that. And then you actually went with it. Yeah. And then like, I, I just loved going to church because of the music. Yeah. You know? I like that part of going to church too. Yeah. And back then I was kind of ashamed of it because I just did not belong. I, I didn't believe in all of that mm. <clears throat> stuff. <laughs> yeah. I believed when I was, I, go, I went through a period of like maybe 12 time. to 15 where yeah. I was a believer. Yeah. I mean, I, I pretended I was, but I, I never really bought into all of that because it was too extreme for me. Like I, I'm sure Jesus is great. Like Jesus is groovy. Like I love Jesus, you know, but I'm just like the rest of it. Are you going to start singing um, the Doobie Brothers? No. Jesus is just all right. I mean, Jesus right. is great, but the rest of all that stuff, I'm like, dude, you got to be kidding me. Like even when I was 12 years old, I was like, yeah right yeah but i think there are so many good things about yeah i'm i'm not church music yeah Yeah. i'm not at all anti-religious me neither and i if it gives people joy i'm i'm all for it yeah what like for me my own pat like i went to church early Mm -hmm. and then i really got into it again like 12 13 14 Mm -hmm. and then i was like oh no this is kind of bogus and and then i got really into science and i got really into reading about science, you know, like in my late teens and early twenties and mm-hmm. things like that. When I started doing my PhD, I really got back into spiritual traditions and I'm <clears throat> far more tolerant of mm-hmm. religious faith now. Yeah, me too. I, I even to like be. admire it a little bit. Like Yeah, yeah, me too. Like, the strange yeah, thing you know, for me is yeah. like the, the the more educated I got like mm-hmm. the like doing my PhD, the more I read about you know, the history of thought, mm-hmm. the more religion is so embedded in us that mm-hmm. we can't really kind of discount it, I, I don't agree. think. So anyway, yeah, that's good. I'm, I'm glad you saw that movie. Then. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that happened. So that's awesome. the second movie is really good just for that. Just good. to... And we should say that this went on to be a big like Broadway musical. I'm not sure if Woody, Whoopi Goldberg was in that. No, but... no, no. The Broadway musical came so much later mm. than the movie. Okay. Like a decade, like, like over a decade later. Mm, maybe it had a kind of revival or something. Yeah, I think so. Because mm. the music is pretty good. Like, Yeah, the music, I had re- I remembered that last song yeah. that they performed. So they yeah. the end of the movie, they performed this song for the Pope. The Pope, mm-hmm. you know, had heard about all of this, you know, community building and, and this great um, mm-hmm. choir and he, the Pope, wanted to see it. So we see the back of the head of the Pope while he's watching the mm-hmm. performance of the song. And it's a great tune. It was. Yeah. It was a cute movie. It was a cute movie. I liked it better than I thought I would. Yeah. Because 90s. Well, you know, I'm, also much, I'm also much. I'm also older now. And yeah, and it's the night, except that the filmmaking was kind of crap in the Yeah, but you, you don't, it doesn't matter anymore. Right. Right. Because it's so like dated yeah. that at some point it just cancels all the, right. you know. <laughs> the bad editing. And- true, true, true. <laughs> All right. So um, I don't know what we're going to do next or what's coming next. Any final thoughts? Yeah. So I, w- we're going to continue with movies about music a little bit more, yeah. longer. And then we're going to move on to movies about places, I think. Yeah. So we, I've been I've been agonizing trying to think of how to... Mm-hmm. Um, transition. Transition and how to rebrand the podcast. Mm-hmm. Because we've got like... I mean, we've got a list of 50 movies about music that Mm -hmm. we haven't done. There's plenty of material there. But like you, like we talked about last week, I think you, and I agree with you that it's kind of, the podcast is a little bit limited. So the idea we were having is just to call it Movies About. But Mm -hmm. then if we're going to have it Movies About Music, Movies About Places, it feels like most things come in three. It feels like we need a third thing, and I don't know what that is. We don't have to decide on Maybe that. we don't have to decide. Yeah. So we may just change the name of the podcast to Movies About, and then we're going to need a new logo. I'm mm-hmm. going to have to redesign a logo. And yeah, and you're going to have to come up with a new theme song. Yeah. So we'll figure that out. But I, I think, think we've got... Yeah. I think what I'd like to do is maybe next week mm-hmm. is do Honeysuckle Rose. Okay. Because we haven't done country music yet. Right, that's And that's true. Willie Nelson. And then I've got... 
one more movies about music before I think we transition. And that's because there's an upcoming anniversary that I don't want to spoil right now. Is it a Nirvana anniversary? Babe. Well, it was just a guess. I didn't know. I just said I didn't want to spoil it. Yeah. (laughs) Fine. (laughs) But yes, it has to do with Nirvana. And now everybody has figured it out. I'm sorry. No, no, it's fine. I can edit it out. (laughs) But maybe I won't because I like our little dumb little (laughs) chats. All right. So take care, everybody. And we'll see you next time. We'll see you next time. Under the moonlight, I'll sing you a song. So you'd magically feel a love that's alone. Hopefully, they'll live eternally. If we paint ourselves all bright with stories. Of heroes and poets and sadness and woe